Okay, now let's go ahead and get started. As we've been talking about the syllabus, classical mythology is about Greek and Roman culture, Greek and Roman mythology, the stories that they tell. I do want to give you a little bit of a warning about what we're going to be talking about. What makes these stories interesting? What makes these stories stay with us? It's two things. Sex and violence. Right? This entire class, we are going to be talking about sex. We are going to be talking about violence. We're going to be talking about sexuality and homosexuality and what the Greek gods did and who they did it to and who slept with who and who had whose baby and who killed people for having whose baby and who killed the person who slept with the other person who slept with the other person who had whose baby. It is all about sex and violence. We're going to start off our story tomorrow when we start looking at where everything came from with a woman who cuts off a man's penis and throws it in the ocean. That's where it all begins. All right. So just a fair warning that the subject matter that we cover in here may be something you're not used to hearing. I'm going to do my best to make it academic, but I'm going to try and make it fun too. All right. So again, just know. As you read through your textbook, as you listen to these, I'm not making this up. This is really what they wrote, and it's really kind of, it's kind of body. It's kind of interesting in a lot of ways. All right, let's take a look at what exactly we mean when we're talking about mythology. There we go. Also, I'm doing this on Prezi, so if you guys want to, you can jump on Prezi if you have a Prezi account. You should. Um, and you can have access to these as well. Okay. Sorry it's yellow. Can everybody... Let's kill some of the lights in here. I do highly, highly recommend that you take notes. If it's important enough for me to uh, put it on a Prezi, it's important for you to write down in your notes. Okay, so before we actually start looking at Greek mythology and Roman mythology, we need to really get a handle on what we mean by classical mythology and what we mean by these ideas uh, in these two words. So... What is classical? This term that we refer to as classical generally refers to ancient Greece and Rome. Now, these are two cultures that are separated by both language and time, but as we'll start to see, especially the Roman culture, it started kind of developing from the Greek culture. Stories were borrowed, stories were changed, and they have this root in Greek culture. Now, does that mean that this idea of the Greek culture was the first to have the, these stories? No, not by a long shot. But they were one of the first to actually start writing them down and recording them. Now, that has good and bad implications, as we'll see, as we start looking, about how, um, start looking at how uh, mythology is researched and some problems that we have in researching it, but we'll get to that later. Um, the zenith, or the peak of the Greek culture, was around 5 B.C., Stop it. Okay, so the, the Greek culture kind of hit its height in 5 BC. And the Roman culture hit its height between 1 BC and 1 AD. Now, the cultures lasted a very long time, but these, these were the points at when they had the most political power, when they had the most cultural power, uh, when they had the most kind of world conquest. So these were the points where we, we could really say this is... Roman Empire. This is Greek Empire. Actually, Empire came about through Rome. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and then, as I said, the Romans adopted a lot of what the Greek stories were. So when we look at this term classical, this is what we mean. Th this is kind of, in a nutshell, what we mean by classical. But then, what do we mean by mythology? Well, by definition, mythology is the study of myth, right? Right? So like biology is the study of life. Geology is the study of the earth. Mythology should mean study of the myth, right? Well, it does 
but it's also taken on this context of the story itself. So if you're reading Greek mythology, you're not reading studies about the Greek myth. You're reading the actual Greek myth most of the time, right? So if you're studying mythology, then yes, you're studying the study of myth. But if you're reading mythology, you're actually just reading the myth itself. So the terms get used interchangeably. So mythology is actually the myths themselves in the context that we'll be talking. Um, yeah. But then we re get into some really big questions here. All right. What is myth? And this is something we're going to talk about for the first half of this entire semester is figuring out exactly what myth is. And it's kind of difficult to define, but in the best kind of definition I could come, could, that I could come up with, pardon me, um, is a traditional, uh, traditional stories a society tells, and then they have these, these kind of roles. So these are traditional stories that a society tells to do things, to explain things, and that's what we're going to look at here. Right. Again, this is a full definition, but I kind of want to cut it off right here is at these are stories that a society tells. Because as we're going to find out today, the things that these stories do change from culture to culture, from time to time. And even within certain cultures, they can tend to you know, get confused on what they're actually used for. All right. Um, myths are handed down. We don't know who wrote them. These are all things that myths do have in common. We do not know who wrote a myth. Right? It's a story that you've heard from someone who heard it from someone who heard it from someone who heard it from someone, which herein, if you see, kind of is where part of the problem begins. You know, it's that idea of the grapevine. If I tell somebody a secret word over here and we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, by the time we get over here to Katura, the word's going to be completely different. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> so when we do that, the story gets changed. And when we see that happen over hundreds of years, it gets changed even more. So this becomes one of the problems that we face when looking at mythology. And as we'll see in a minute, there's actually a paradox that, that occurs. Um, myth addresses the past. There is no such thing as a current myth. All right? Now, we use this word myth loosely. For example, you might hear somebody say, love at first sight is a myth, right? That's re not really the proper use of the word. Love at first sight doesn't exist would be another way to say that. But the idea of doesn't exist and myth, they're not really interchangeable. A myth is a story, and it is a story about the past. Um, it do now, how long in the past? Who's to say? But it's, uh, it's usually about a civilization or culture that no longer exists, right? So when we're talking about the idea of nobody knowing who wrote it, and it has to be in the past, normally in the distant past, where there's no way to, to kind of reference check it, we're starting to see even more problems of checking these myths. Now, um, myths present themselves as factual accounts. Cultures don't recognize mythology as mythology. So a myth presents itself as this is the truth. And if you subscribe to that truth, you do not see that as a myth. You see it as the truth. Good example of this, a few good examples of this, uh, Christianity. If you are a Christian, you do not see the story of Jesus as a myth. You see it as the gospel, which is another word for the truth. However, if you're not Christian, you see the Christian story as just a story, as a myth. Same thing with Buddhism, same thing with Islam. If you're outside of the religion, then you see that, that idea as a myth, whereas the people that are inside see it as the truth. So the only way to see something as a myth is to see it from the outside. The only way you can look at a myth is from the outside, because if you're on the inside, you're seeing it as a truth. You're not seeing it as a myth, right? Uh, where are we at? That's what we just said. <laughs> Mythology is looked at from the outside. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, myth explains, justifies, instructs, or warns. Myths don't just tell a story. <laughs> 
There's a reason for the myth. And as we'll see over the next couple of classes, there's some very important ideas for society, especially pre-literate societies, meaning uh, societies that don't write yet, on why these myths came about. We may actually talk a little bit about it here in just a few minutes. But the idea here is that these stories were written in order to do one of these few things, right? Uh, the myth was written to explain, justify, instruct, or warn. Explain. The idea of the explanatory myth. I've got them kind of written out here so you can see what we're talking about. Um, the idea of the explanatory myth is call, also called etiological. So the idea of an etiological idea. Sorry about that. An etiological myth is an explanatory myth. Where did fire come from? Why does fire burn my hand? Um, why do we have seasons? This is a, one that we'll actually talk about uh, when we talk about Persephone. Talk about Persephone, the idea that Persephone was down in the underworld. We'll get into the long story about her relationship with Hades, but the reason that she, or the, the reason that we have seasons is because she has to spend time down in the underworld and is only allowed back up on Earth every so often. So this explains why we have certain things. The idea to justify, uh, ideological myths explain, uh, charter myths, charter myths justify. So, if I decided, oh, that's a cool water bottle, I'm going to take it. All right. I just, I just took Neil's water bottle, right? But I think it's right. Why? Because I have a story that can justify why I needed that water bottle. <laughs> so charter myths actually come in to explain, to justify action, all right? Sorry. <laughs> Comes in to justify action, or to justify not only, not only actions of humans, but also the actions of the gods, or of science, or of nature. Justify the why certain things happen. The explaining, the idea of the ideological myth explains the how, or the what, uh, the Charter myth explains why. It justifies why these things happen. Why bad things happen to good people. Right? It's kind of the root of how that works. Um, da, 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 da. Instruct. The idea of the instructional myth, what did I put down here? Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, it's just instruction. <laughs> the instructional myth, um, it usually has to do with how to be a better person and how to be a better society. So the stories that we will look at will be extremely relevant in the idea of civilization. In this idea of what makes a person civilized, what makes a community civilized, what makes a city civilized, and what makes a country civilized. This is going to revolve a lot, especially in the early, early days, around agriculture. So there will be instructions about when to plant, how to plant, what to plant, where to plant, and this actually becomes the, the root, ha, 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 of what creates a civilization, all right? So the instructional myth is how to become a better person or a better uh, part of civilization. Uh, da, da, da. And then we have the warning myths. Now, this thing really does not want to stay turned around. The warning myths generally try and keep us safe, but they do so by showing us the results of bad behavior. They don't show us the prosperity of the good person they show us the demise of the bad person. Case in point, we start our story off how? With a woman cutting off a man's penis. Now, he did something to deserve having that cut off, or did he, as we'll discuss that. But the idea is, is we don't see the just. We don't see the upright. We see the bad things. We see the people who do wrong things. We see the people who get into trouble, and these become warnings of this is why you shouldn't behave this way. There's hardly ever one that says, you should be good, you should, not, or you should not steal. Most of them are like, if you steal, you're going to turn into a monster with six heads. So it takes this idea of the bad and, makes, and exaggerates it in a way that, that scares you. It uses fear as a prime motivator. Let's see how we're doing on time. We're doing just fine. Okay, 
three of the types of things we're going to look at in this class, and they're all going to kind of be rolled into this idea of myth. Um, as we see in classical mythology, we're going to see a lot of these story types that fold into the mythos, right? This is a type of rhetoric as well. Remember that in your other classes, we've talked about logos, ethos, and pathos. Mythos ties back to the idea of the myth, the idea of the archetype, the idea of the story. So in the idea of the myth, we also have this idea of the legend and the idea of folklore, all right? Now, there are three types of these. Myths are stories that relate directly to the gods, all right? If we're looking at the, the, the root definition of a myth, it has to have something to do directly with the gods. So the story of Chaos and Kronos and Rhea and Zeus and Hera, these are stories that are directly about the gods, right? They don't, well, they sometimes involve humans, but the humans aren't really important in how the story is told. That's where we start coming into this idea of legends. And legends are traditional stories rooted in historical fact. Now, these stories do tend to have humans in them. And as we'll see, a lot of times these humans were real people, or at least representative of real people. Um, Hercules, it's argued, is representative of someone who actually existed. Heracles was actually his, his Greek name. Um, Theseus, someone else that we'll look at, was also rooted in the idea of somebody real. But what happens is the legend takes over. The, the embellishment, the exaggeration takes over into the legend. Good example of this, uh, how many of you have heard of a guy from the United States named George Washington? Who was George Washington? First president of the United States. Right. Now, there is legend associated with George Washington. We hear about the stories about him chopping the cherry tree or throwing the silver coin all the way across the Delaware River. Can a human really do this? Can a human really cut down a cherry tree with one chop? Can he throw a coin across a river that's over half a mile wide? No. These are attributes that are starting to be given to him to give him legendary status. So the way that a legend develops is it normally starts with a good central idea. It starts with something that's honest, but then people adore or fear the person to the extent that it becomes exaggerated. All right? So the legend is usually rooted in truth, but becomes exaggerated or embellished. Do what? Do what? Genesis, like the book of the Bible? It is about the humans, but here's the problem. This is why it's not legend. We have no proof that these people really existed. It has to be rooted in historical fact, right? Um, it would, I would actually go with that as being myth. You know, again, if we're looking at this on the outside of Christianity, if we're looking at this as, as not a Christian looking at the Bible as literature... I would say that this is a sense of myth. Why? Because the entire story, it's not about Adam and Eve. This, the book of Genesis is not about Adam and Eve. It's not about the humans. It's about God creating the earth. It is a, it is a platform to tell the story, this is why our earth is here. It is a myth. It instructs us how it explains. It is an ideological myth about a monotheistic God. By the way, that, that's a, a term that we'll be addressing here. Do you know the difference between monotheistic and polytheistic? You ever heard those words? Monotheistic and polytheistic. Um, Latin root. We're going to talk a lot about Latin and Greek language in here. By the way. Mono. Mono means one God. Monotheism. Mo, mono deity. Mono, mono thing to worship in the sky. <laughs> Poly means many. So the idea of mythology, the idea of Greek mythology, classical mythology, is all polytheistic. Hindu is polytheistic. Um, certain types of Buddhism are polytheistic. Whereas, oh... Don't you do this. All right, there we go. Um, whereas the ideas of Christianity, 
Judaism, Islam, these are all ideas of monotheistic religions. So those are two terms that will be coming up. That's a good question, Neil. Any other questions about this before we move forward? You bring up a good question, and you're probably sitting here going, but wait, you just said this, but it's gonna, it, that contradicts what... All right, here's another disclaimer. You're going to find out as we talk about this that different ideas are going to contradict each other. Different stories are going to contradict each other. So you're going to read in your book a story about Aphrodite, for example. And then I'm going to tell you a story about Aphrodite. And you're going to be like, wait, 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 wait. That's not the story that was in my book. You're absolutely right. It's totally different. There are about 12 to 1,200 different interpretations of these stories. You need to understand this. What I'm giving you in class is an overview. What your book is giving you is an overview. And your book even tells you there are other versions of these stories. There are other canonical versions of these stories, which means that even in a canon of, of texts about Zeus, for example, you may find 10 or 12 different versions of the same story of the birth of Athena and how that worked. There is no one individual story. And a lot of the stories that I say are not going to make sense. And a lot of the ways that we look at these stories are not going to make sense. And a lot of the ways that the stories progress and then try to draw back on one another, it's not going to make sense. Just like most mythological texts and religious texts, there are holes. There are holes that you have to fill in with your own ideas of critical thinking and your own ideas of creative thinking as well to figure out how they got to it. Now, I will stop at some points and say, look, guys, this is not going to make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to them. It doesn't make sense to the people who study this. We just have to assume that this is what they thought. So at these points where we do have a lot of multiple interpretations, I will stop us to let us know, to, to let us kind of look at it in a little bit better light. Okay, uh, moving on. Folklore. Folklore are stories that, primarily, that are primarily entertaining. They often have animals or clever people. Now, when I say clever, I don't mean smart. Clever means sly. Clever means they find a way to trick somebody into getting something done. Theseus is one of these. Hercules is one of these. Although they're legend, a lot of the story that they have is folklore. Especially when we start dealing with Hercules and the trials of Hercules. Man, that's so much fun because we start seeing all these really weird beasts and animals. Um, and, that's gonna t that's, and again, that's where we start tying in this idea of folklore and legend together into things that become myth. So we start to see all of these working together to create this culture of myth that we're going to really study. Oh, and that's kind of what I said there. Okay. So, when we think about the importance of myth, we need to look at this idea of writing. Again, the idea of the Greek culture and why we study the Greek culture so much when it comes to ideas of mythology and why they've influenced us so much primarily comes down to this idea of writing, of cuneiform writing transferred into uh, phonetic writing. Right? Yes, I know Chinese writing came long before this, but it stayed in a symbol form. It was difficult for that symbol form to transition between cultures. With, a, with the phonetic alphabet brought over from the Phoenician sailors, it was much easier to transfer information, to translate information between cultures. So what happens is we start to see these myths, we start to see these stories moving from culture to culture, from civilization to civilization around uh, the, the area that we call the Fertile Crescent. We're going to look at a map of this tomorrow and see exactly where it is. But what happens is we start to see these stories not just spread but also evolve. And one of the things, did I talk about it in this one? Hold on, let me see if I'm going to. I'm going to talk about this. Yes, okay. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but the ideas of these myths in pre-literate societies, this was all they had for information. This is how they got their information. This is how they got their ideas of what to do and what not to do and when to plant and when not to plant and you know when to go to bed and when to stay up and how to ward off animals, pretty much everything that they knew. Everything they knew to keep them alive was done through story, was done through myth. It was very seldom that it was just done, you know, Neil, you should not stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning. 
Well, why? Because Neil would go, well, why? Why shouldn't I? Well, let me tell you the story about Nix and Knight. So it was always accompanied with a story. Because these were critical thinkers. This was the birth of critical thinking. This was the birth... Think of, think of, the, of civilization as a child, right? At this point, imagine that the entire idea of classical civilization is a two-year-old. And what is a two-year-old's favorite question? Why? <laughs> Why? 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 So how do we address the why? Psychologically, we give them a story. We give them something they can relate to. You've been around small children. What happens when they want to know why? Well, you tell them a story. Where did babies come from? Why, is there, why do we have babies? Well, you remember we made up the story about the stork, and we've told that story before. So the idea is you make up a story that makes it palatable, that makes it able for the person to understand, to digest, but more importantly, to obey. All right? So the fact that the story was a lie, the fact that the story was a myth, doesn't matter as long as that little child does what he or she is supposed to do, as long as that society does what, what they are supposed to do. So the idea of the myth becomes a way of keeping order. Right? Now, some of the difficulties we face in looking at the myth, I've addressed a few of them so far. Um, where are we at? Okay. When we're looking at this idea of myth, um, as we just addressed, there's no, there's, there's no real distinction between metaphor and literal. All right? Now, what do I mean by this? When we start talking about the Titans and the beginnings and everything like that tomorrow, uh, in the beginning of the story, we didn't have gods. We had representations. For example, chaos. Right? You know the word chaos as, as things that are all mixed up and jumbled up, right? Chaos, the actual real meaning of the word chaos is nothing. Void. Nothingness. Right? So... What we call the God, chaos, he's not a God. He is chaos. He is nothingness. So, a little confusing, but for example, Zeus is the God of the sky. Poseidon is the God of the sea. However, uh, let's say Hades. Hades is the God of the underworld. However, Tartarus is not the god of the underworld. Tartarus is the underworld. But it's the underworld in human form. It's called anthropomorphizing. 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 It's when we give a human form. For example, when we say that the idea of God, as the Christian God, is an old man with a white beard sitting on top of a cloud. We personify this idea of God. We personify this idea of chaos or nothingness. Gaia, for example. Gaia is <clears throat> the earth. She is not the goddess of the earth. She is the earth. Now, Notice we don't say it is the earth. We still say she is the earth because there's still the personification. Even though we don't see her as the god or the, or the keeper of something, we still see her as a female figure even though, you know, that's Gaia. I'm, I'm kicking Gaia in the butt right now. <laughs> so we personify him through action, through metaphor. We still do this. We've done, oh man, I can't. I don't know if it's been done around here, but especially during the 1970s, all the way through the 1990s in California, people chaining themselves to trees because they don't want you to hurt or kill Mother Earth, right? Mother Earth, Father Time. Is Earth really an old woman? <laughs> no, but we co we come to think of her as a female figure through action. Father Time, Mother Earth. These are personifications. It's not like it is the god of time. Cronus, actually Cronus is not the god of time. But Gaia is not, and we'll talk more about this in more detail tomorrow. But just know this. 
until the Olympians, until Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Hera, all the, the, all the Olympians, there were no gods of. Right? That's, there were no gods of dot, dot, dot. There was just the thing. Nyx was the night. Gaia was the earth. Chaos was the void, was the nothingness. Okay? Um, we'll get into more detail about that. All right, the other thing that we have here is that we have a paradox in this. As I've said, we don't know who wrote this. We're also looking at this in a preliterate society. Preliterate meaning before people could write. Yet, how do we study Greek and Roman mythology? Through literature, right? So there, there's kind of a, a strange paradox here. We have to look at this through literature, but we also have to look at it through an anthropological standpoint. We need to look at it through how civilizations behaved based on these myths, based on these ideas set forth. What literature did they create? What literature moved forward? What archetypes held on? What practices from those archetypes held on? And we also start to see the birth of this idea of literature in people like Homer and Hesiod and Apollodorus. Um, so we'll start, those are the three that we're going to be looking at uh, primarily in this class. We'll talk and Ovid, we'll get into the, the, the Roman ideas as well. Dang it. Sorry, having some technical difficulty. Thank you. <laughs> get back to where I was. Okay. The other problem we look at, not only do we not have literature from that exact time, remember, myth is written about stuff in the past, so we're even further separated from it. But beyond that, cultures know the myth. Now, what do I mean by this? If, for example, please don't turn that off, I'm very hot up here. <laughs> okay, one rule for my class, guys. You can put on more clothes than you want me to take off. All right? So if you're cold, bring a jacket, please, because as I'm moving around up here, uh, I do get a little warm. And there's only, like, one spot, like, right here. I'll just teach right here. How's that? Because <laughs> the, the air doesn't hit all the way up here. Instead, I get the heat from the projector, so please just bring a jacket or something. Um, okay, so the idea is that the culture knows the myth. What problem does this create? Well, if you already know the story... There are a lot of parts you don't write down, right? If we look, for example, we're going to see some really interesting thoughts on this in a minute. Um, if we think, for example, back to this idea of George Washington. If we're talking about the United States, it is a given that most of the people in the United States know that George Washington was the first president of the United States. What we don't know, or what a lot of people don't know that they're taught, are these legends, so then what happens is we get little pieces of information. We don't have the root. We don't have the core of that information from the myth. The idea that possibly the myth was based in reality, we can't trust that. We can't really look for it. We have, well, we can if we can put together archaeological evidence and anthropological evidence and cultural history evidence. We have to start putting these together from all different, all different points. The other thing that we look at and this may answer a question some of you guys were asking it a few semesters ago, uh, is poetry. These stories, these instructions, these explanations have first been really chronicled as poetry. Why is it important to understand poetry? It's important to understand the birth of civilization. It's important to understand how these ideas were transformed, how they were conveyed to other people. They were done so in poetry. Why? Because it's like a song. It's easy to remember. So this idea of the instruction, this idea of the explanation, this idea of the warnings, were all done in forms of song or poetry. So it becomes very important to understand not just what the poetry is saying, but how the poem is saying it as well. Looking at the idea of meter, looking at the idea of word sound. There are a lot of uh, poetic studies or studies of poetics that look back at these, these particular verses to see how they're translated, to see how they were actually used as instructional tools. So we're looking at archaeology, we're looking at anthropology, we're looking at linguistics, we're looking at poetics, we're looking at all these different things trying to piece together an idea of what 
the myth actually is, but also why the myth actually is, what its purpose is and how it works. All right? Most literature is lost. We've talked about that. And then the idea of the archaeological evidence. Um, archaeological evidence is spotty. There's not much of it. Okay. So let's get this idea then of some of the difficulties and what we're talking about, um, differences in the way things are seen. Have you heard the story of Jason and the Argonauts? Jason and the Golden Fleece? Ah, parts of it. This one that we'll study. We'll study the story of Jason. Odysseus. <laughs> um, okay. Basically, spoiler alert, he's sent to find a golden fleece and he finds it. And he comes back a hero, right? So the literature that we have, the text that we have from Apollodorus and from Ovid shows that Jason finds the golden fleece and comes back a hero. And we even have artistic representations of Jason, the hero with the golden fleece. But guess what happened? we found some artwork. Look at this. What do you see in this picture? Much like the story of Jason, there's a dragon. There's a golden fleece. But it uh, doesn't look like Jason did too well in his quest. We've also found other pieces of artwork that, again, through the cuneiform, through the actual um, stories that were found and through the places where these pieces were found, we know this is Jason. But we found yet another version of the story showing that Jason didn't succeed. So as we're going to find out, as you, as you maybe look at some different stories, you're going to find that the stories are not static. They're still changing. We're still finding ideas of different types of these stories and how they were interpreted in different societies. The question then becomes, why did certain societies choose to change the outcome of such a prolific story? Why did they choose to change these ideas? What was the lesson that needed to be learned? What needed to be taught? Right? So, let's pretend. Let's pretend. Let's imagine 2,000 years from now. 2,000 years in the future. We're going to imagine, we're going to pretend that uh, America just doesn't do too well. <laughs> we piss somebody off way too much. <laughs> and this is New York City, 2,000 years from now. It's actually from a video game. But, um, <laughs> this is New York 2,000 years from now. And we look, and we're looking around New York City, and we come across a book. And it says, you know, we're, we're, we're a new civilization. We're either from another planet and we're, or we're evolved. We don't know what this place is, right? We find this book and somehow, magically, we're able to read it, right? <laughs> but it has the letter G on it. And it also has this word encyclopedia. So we have at our disposal G. All the, all the encyclopedic entries of the letter G in an encyclopedia. And we start reading through and we're like, oh, wait. Gothic cathedrals, Gothic churches. Gothic churches are known for their arched spires, right? So like the, the outside of a church usually has these peaks, right? So, oh, great. We now know what Gothic churches look like, which means we can identify all the Gothic churches, right? Can we? Really? <laughs> If we get this idea of the Gothic arches, if we get this idea of a church, a Gothic church is defined by its arches, and that's all the information we have, and then we run across these every single block, not only do we make the false assumption that this is a church, actually I guess in a way it kind of is, but, uh, we make the false assumption that this is a church, but we also make the false assumption that it is a widespread extremely widespread religion because we see this literally every block. So this is one of the problems we run into when we're studying mythology is our ideas of interpretation change. We have very little information to go on and we're trying to put together all these tiny pieces of information to make something that's more manageable, something that's easier to make sense. 
Questions? All right, guys, we are going to, the last half of the class, we're going to watch a film about Greek culture and looking at who these crazy people are that we're really going to start studying. Before we do that, though, I'm going to let you go ahead and take about a, let's say about a five-minute break, ten-minute break. Do whatever you need to do, and we'll come back in a minute and take care of this.